So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. When we're there, say amen. 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 This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boisterous, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, inconsistent, furious, despisers of those that do good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having the form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For this is the sort are they which creep into houses and led captive silly women laden with sin, led away with diverse lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So, when I was really getting into this and really searching this out, because remember, I'm on seducing spirits. And when I started to look at this, I thought, what is the one thing that when you read every one of these characters that Paul named that was going to come and manifest in this last day, what could every one of them be labeled? If I was just going to think of one word, just one word that would categorize every one of them words that is there, what would you think that word would be? How about selfish? And you start to think about this, and this is the way that the world is becoming. Because I want to read to you what selfish, the, diction, or the definition of selfish is. Selfish is having or showing concern only for yourself and not the need or feelings of other people's. Concerned excessively or exclusively with oneself. So now, let's go back and we start over at this. Because this says, For this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now let's just break this down. I think I've taught over this and some of you may know this and I'm just going to pretend like you don't because there may be others here that doesn't. But this right here where it says, Know this, and that word this there, or know there, I believe it's genitzgo, which means to have a perception or an idea or a revelation of knowledge. And so it says, come to understand this. That in the last, and that word last is eschatos. It's where we get the English word for eschatology, which means the study of, last, of the last of the last things. People that study things that are nearly on the brink of extinction or things that had come to the end of its life, that's what they study. They study eschatology. And so that eschatos is explicitly meaning and pointing to the last of the last of the last of the last of the last things. And so what is the things that it is pointing toward? Days. So it's not just talking about the last days. It's talking about the last of the last of the last of the last days. Do we understand that? Yes. And so, as it's pointing to that, and it's telling us the last of the last of the last days, that word perilous means dangerous. It means, uh, uh, it could mean dangerous. It could mean certain destruction. And so, uh, uh, I'm looking for another word that I had wrote down there that it also meant other than uh, uh, dangerous or perilous, uh, uh, dangerous, perilous, and concerning an excessive, overweighting, welling fear. So when we start looking at that, it's pointing towards today. You, there is more fear and uncertainty than ever before in any other age. We don't know where 
this world where the economy is going to be next. We don't know where our government's going to be next. We don't know where our military is going to be next. And this is not just the United States. We're talking global. Global uncertainty all over. And, and so then we see this and we start to think, now when Paul starts going into, and he's telling Timothy this, and for men shall be lovers of their own selves. That means that they will want to do for themselves more than anybody else. Man, I mean, you look at this, this is a cutthroat world. I mean, somebody will step on somebody, they will lie on them, they will do uh, horrendous her, things to them for a dollar raise on a job. I mean, look, I mean, they would sell themselves out for, for 50 cents or a dollar raise. They will lie, they will cheat, they will steal, they will be, be uh, accused, they will destroy people's lives for a buck. A skinny dollar at that. And so that that means that they are lovers of themselves. Covetous? Oh man, what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine. Man, you can't go down the road and you can't... This is something that I remember when I was real little. My aunt, she got on to me. Uh, my aunt Troy Faye, she got on to me and she scolded me one time. We were doing something and I said, Ooh, I would like to have there and I can't even remember what it was. And I was maybe like seven or eight years old. And she just got all over me like a, 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 a duck on a June bug. And she said, you can't say that. And then she started telling me, you can say, I would like to have something like that. Or I would rather have something that if, that if I could like that. But you don't say that you want that person's thing. And she started teaching me about what covetousness was. Desiring the things of somebody else. I mean, you look at this, marriages fall apart. Jobs fall apart, things fall apart, people will leave one job that is a good job where God's intends to go to another job because they can have more money or do this or do that. I mean, it's just, look at how this day and age of how they covet everything. And that is to desire what is not yours. Boasters, everybody feels like they have to brag. And why do they have to brag? It's because they have to feel important. They have to feel like they're somebody. They cannot just be content in who Christ has made them. They're just not happy being made in God's image. They have to be something else. So they're very boisterous. And so we get to going on here and then we see proud. And they're proud to be boisterous of who they are. Yeah? Blasphemers. Talking against. Disorder or, or disobedient to parents. My goodness, how many people, I mean, we've got some counselors in here that does family counseling. And you look at how many children nowadays that come up and that they're so disobedient to parents. My goodness, we went to Atlas's kindergarten or preschool, whatever it was, graduation today, and, and there was a, that room was in there in Paris, and I think I was the only one, and I was a grandparent that made Alice mine. Yeah. I'm telling you, man, them parents, as soon as them kids, one kid, he threw himself on the floor and goes, eh! and all about that time, his mother just went and sat down and just let him go wild. And not only him, but every kid in that place was doing the same thing. And so I snatched that list up and I said, do you want me to take you back there and spank you in front of all these people? No, Papa. Then you sit down and behave. <laughs> but see, this is the era that we live in to where these kids, it is instilled into them. And do you think it's going to get any better? Do you think that these kids are going to somewhere supernaturally just snap into a place of complacency and, and, and compliance with their parents? No, they're not. It's a spiritual, it's a spiritual condition. It has nothing to do with teaching. Uh, I mean, nothing to do with these kids being taught or not. What they're doing is the spirit that is in them is dictating how the parents act. It's a spiritual condition. But we see this. We see that they're unthankful and unholy. We see, that, we see that they're out without natural affection. And what that word right there, without natural affection, means, it means that they don't have the love for their parents or for their relatives or their siblings like they should. 
They just don't care. I mean, you know, uh, man, I mean, for first, if you ever told your parent when I was growing up that I hate you, man, they would knock your teeth down your throat. Right? I mean, that was just, that was a, that was a, a given. They taught you that respect. They taught you that level of respect, and then through that teaching their respect, you also learn to honor them. And so we see now that there is no, there's no love for parents. You got kids divorcing their parents because they didn't get an iPhone or they didn't get their way and going to courts and saying they're horrible people. And then you got courts that literally listen to them. You know, I seen on Facebook here a while back that there was this, there was a skit or there's scene, and this kid he called the police, and he because his mother was was spanked him with a belt, and here come the police, and the police knock on the door and said, "Ma'am, there's been a case of child abuse that's been reported here," and and, and she said, "Have you spanked your son or have you hit your son lately?" And she said, "Yes." And then she goes over and she explains to the officer, some probably had seen it, and she explained exactly what it was, and so and the kids just rattled on, she done this and she done that, and then. She She's admitting to it, and then the officer pulls that boy back over and says, let me tell you something, son. If you ever call again, it's going to happen again. I'm going to give her my belt to do this to you. <laughs> you know, we have lost that in society. Yes, we have. And why? Because of selfishness. Selfishness. We see here, Truth makers. Man, when somebody used to make their word, their word used to mean something. And now it's nothing. Man, you can't go in, in anymore, you know, uh, uh, and I know that there are some good car salesmen out there, but there's a lot that, that you know, they'll go, well, I give you my word. Yeah. Brother Travis is going through some of that on a tractor. Yeah. Yeah. And see the thing. <laughs> and the thing is, <laughs> and the thing is, and I hate to make it an example, but the motor was blowed up in it. And so, but the whole deal is, is so they're a truce breaker. They give their word and their word has no value. No value. Where we like to think and we like to try to honor someone's word or what their statue is, but yet there is no conviction. And it goes back to being covetous and greedy and high-minded. And so, which is still being selfish. We see that there is false accusers. Now, that false accusers there is a very familiar word, diabolos. How many of us know what that word diabolos means? Satan means the devil. And so I thought that was very unique as I was studying this out, that that right there where it says false accusers, and then when you look at the Greek word, diabolos. And so we see that here that Satan, that we, when we see the word devil translated into the English Bible, into the, into the New Testament, it's not a description, it's not a name of Satan or another name of him. It's a description of how that he operates and how he works in our lives. And so we see here that people are false accusers, and we went over that because of their greed and because of their jealousy and how that there are, that they'll do anything to accuse somebody or to lie on somebody to get an extra dollar. They don't care. Inconsistent. Man, consistency, there are some people that you could count on time and time again, and now people are so inconsistent in this world. Furious, that's anger. Man, there are so many people that has anger issues. Man, I, I don't know if I didn't notice it when I was younger, but I could go on construction sites where there are all these men out there was about half whacked out of their head and stuff like that. 25, you know, almost 30 years ago could go out there and be amongst all them men and not see half the anger is what you see nowadays in people. I mean, and you think that out there on a job site would be the prime place for anger and testosterone to be flying around. And you don't see it half as much as what you do today. And then you see 
despisers of those that do good. I was working with someone that was in drug court and very quickly something told me in my spirit as they were teaming up and pairing up with people, I said, you need to separate yourself from these people right now. They are not your friends. And the better you do, the more they're going to hate you and the more they're going to work against you. And sure enough, that was the end result. And so we think that, that sometimes that we see that when we do good, the world even hates us more to put us down. And then the bad thing about it is, is when you're doing good in church, your brother sitting next to you or up a pew or down a pew is probably one that is despising against you because you're being blessed. And so that we see that there, there is traits, that they're traitors, that they're high-minded, that they're heady, and lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Man, they would rather do the things of this world. They would rather come in here and put on a form of godliness on Sunday and then go out and live like the devil seven or six more days out of the week. And people think that that's okay. And I believe that that's why God has led me to this point and led me to teach and preach on this so heavily is that we got to get it in our minds because I want to tell you, it's not my job to get you into heaven. It's my job to give you the word and it's your job to apply that to get yourself into heaven. And see, we have put too much stock into ministers and preachers into getting us to where we need to be. And so instead of taking personal responsibility, and we have allowed these things to come into the body of Christ. We have allowed every one of these things to operate in the church. Because here's what I want to point out to you. Who do you think that Paul was describing and who do you think that he was talking about when he was telling this to Timothy? Do you think that he was pointing out the pagan worshiper down the street? Do you think that he was pointing out the neighbor that was next door to the people there? Do you, who do you think that Paul was describing to Timothy to be aware of in the last days? It was the people that is inside of the church is the ones that have all of these selfish traits. So I started asking myself, and that goes back to the seducing spirits. How did these people become to where they were lovers of themselves more than they were lovers of God? How did they get to where they were proud and haughty? How did they get to the point to where they coveted everything that everybody had in the church? How did they get to where there was so much false accusers and backbiters? There is more accusations and more lies and accusing and backbiting and talking inside the church than anywhere else. You don't have this much gossip and this much backbiting out of a job. So where is it coming from? The enemy is targeting through seducing spirits to open up doors in our lives. And see, I said this before. You know, a seducing spirit only works in a Christian's life. It has no need and no principle of being of working anywhere outside other than the church house. Why? Because a seducing spirit is designed to lead you out of the church house. It has no reason to work in your life outside. If you're the drunkard, down the street that's in the ditch has no need to work in your life. You're already where you need to be as far as that evil spirit is concerned. See, and then, so a seducing spirit comes in to the church house and it works against the children of God, getting us and looking for areas that he can come in and take a hold in us. Now, see, this is what I was talking about a few weeks ago. A seducing spirit will come in here and you say, well, pastor, I don't have no seducing spirit. I don't have no problem with seducing spirits. Okay, have you ever hit the snooze button and went back to sleep when the Spirit of God is telling you to get up? Has the Spirit of God ever woke you up and you laid there and you didn't do anything? Has the Spirit of God told you that you need to go to church and you laid there and said, I'm too tired. I need to stay here and relax for a while. I deserve this. I've worked too much. Has the seducing spirit ever told you that to go and pray for someone and you go well I just don't know I, I'm just not sure of myself I don't know if I have the ability I don't know if I can say the right words Amen. see that's how seducing spirit works is it drops these ideas into your mind working against you trying to separate what God is trying to get you to do 
And once that you fall trapped or in lieu of that trap there, now that spirit, that seducing spirit, has completed its job. It's done. And see, that's why the church, I believe, has missed it the whole time. Because they go, well, I don't have a seducing spirit. There ain't nothing that's seducing me to go out and driving me into lust or into this or into that. See, but here's the thing. Once the seducing spirit gets you to open up a door in your life, it's over. It's done its job. It's off working on somebody else. As soon as it gets Travis, it's off on Nikki. And then as soon as it gets Mickey, it's going to be on Cheryl. Because what it's doing is looking for a door, and once that we give in to the flesh and we open up that door, now there is other areas for other spirits to come into our lure, into our life, to work selflessly that works through pride and greed and seduction and other areas in our lives that would be here high-minded, haughtiness, anger, and backbiting. Gets us into where that we don't have love for our brothers or sisters anymore. See, all it's doing is just working for a crack in our lives. And as long as we're willing to give it a crack, I promise you it's going to be willing to be working overtime in our lives. I promise you that there is not a church in the United States or anywhere in the world that does not have a load of seducing spirits working against the people. Because if it wasn't, the church houses would be building and be exploding out the seams. Think about that. Because there'll be nothing drawing them away from God. There'll be nothing in these last days working against them. And see, here is something that proves that we're talking about the people in the church. Because in verse 5, 6, and 7, when Paul gets done naming all of these things and characteristics of people, it says, having the form of godliness and denying the power thereof, such turn away. Hmm. That doesn't sound like somebody that's out there on the street corner. No. That sounds like somebody that's in the church. Right? You know, how do we get to the point to where we deny the power of God? How do we get to a point to where that we start judging things and we start doing things and we become an enemy of God? How do we get to that point? By a spirit coming in and leading us into error. Now, see, I want you to look at that because, see, it says having the form. And that form right there, I just, I got, I just love when I do word studies and things just fall together. Man, it gets exciting. And see, because it says having the form, that word form there is morophobias. And so that kind of sounds like an English word. And I thought, man, that kind of sounds like a word. Now, I'm see, I come from HHU, Hillbilly Hill University, but that kind of sounds like mordo, mordo supius. And so I started looking it up, and I looked it up, and it says, to form. It says, the process or the activity of forming or shaping into something. Mm. Now think about that for a second. Having the form, and that warm form there, morophobias, means the process of something being actively formed or shaped into something. And it's saying that you have the form of godliness and denying the power. You have a form that is being shaped and twisted and formed into something that is against God. Now, why would Satan need to do that to a sinner that is out in the street? So, here's the thing. Little by little, we see people come into the church and we see them fall out of the church. We see them changing into something different. The enemy is drawing and leading them away. And see, when I looked up that word... Metaphorpius, or a metaphorpius, and that is to what a butterfly does. And it means a change, and that's where we get our English word for metaphorpius, phobius, uh, uh, a change of the form or nature of a person or thing to a completely different one by nature or natural or supernatural means. 
That's the English definition for it. The enemy is slowly working in our lives, getting us to open up doors because he can bring in other areas in our lives to mislead us. He is shaping us, drawing us, and transforming us slowly instead of into God's image and to his image of the world. That's why you have more backbiting. That's why you have more gossiping. That's why you have more covenants. That's why you have more boasting and more proud. That's why you have more dis- uh, uh, blaspheming and disobedience in church than you do anywhere else. It's because the enemy is slowly transforming us into his image rather than us being transformed into God's image. And us, and I'm not talking about just us, I'm talking about us in general as the body of Christ, is just silently sitting by and watching it happen. Why our children fall apart, why our families and our spouses fall apart, why our own lives fall apart. I don't know about you, but does that not now just kind of disgust you? I mean, because see, the only way that God has given me a revelation that I can do any kind of spiritual warfare is I got to have such a holy, a holy disgust that is inside of me that it just makes me sick to where I want to vomit every time I think about how the enemy is working in not only my life, but your lives. And without that holy disgust, we will continue to let it operate. And so that's why I've taken so much time to break down what this spirit of seduction is doing in our lives. Because unless you look at yourself and you evaluate yourself and you go, oh my gosh, I am disgusted with this spirit and I want free of it, God. I'll do whatever it takes in my life. I'll repent. I will say, God, whatever it takes, God, I want free of it. I want changed of it. We ain't going to get free. We have to be utterly disgusted with the spirit and the way the enemy has worked in our lives before we'll ever want to change. It takes a revelation. Some of you think that I just love getting up here and stomping on your toes. But see, here's the reason. The whole reason is so that we can take a personal reflection with the word of God in context and look at it and say, Oh, Holy Spirit, Father, forgive me. I need help. Other than that, we keep a play in church day after day after day, thinking that everything is okay, and it's not. I'm tired of church as usual. And if you want church as usual, then you might as well take your cushion and go somewhere else because I'm tired of it. I want change. I want change not only in my life, but I want change in your life. I want change in your life. I want to see things happening in you. I want you walking in victory in your lives. I want to see every one of your children grown and and, uh, not grown. I want to see every one of your grandchildren lining the pews of this place. I want this place to be busting at the seam because you have got disgusted with what the enemy has done in your life and you're ready for change in your life and sell out to God and no matter what the cost is in your life. We need a revelation of that. Because without a revelation of that, there's plenty of churches that's going on just as church as usual. Some churches are more worried about doctrine or worried about this or that. And yes, doctrine is important. Doctrine gives us a foundation that when the enemy comes and tries to lie to us, we have something on to stand on. But when all you preach is doctrine, all you're worried about is just one thing or another thing, I'm telling you, you've got something working in your life and you're missing the whole thing. Because we need to be more worried about what is in us working against us than where that we are standing on doctrine. See, in Hebrews it tells us to move past that doctrine. We already have a foundation in it. Now that we have a foundation, move on to something deeper in your spiritual life. Chew on that for a minute. And I'll come back to you. See, but what better way can the devil derail you in your life and derail the kingdom of God is to fill a church with a whole bunch of people 
that has the dead works in their life. Day by day, service by service, word by word, he is looking for people that is half asleep in the spirit to where he can twist and manipulate the word of God in their lives. I've seen so many people that come away from a church service with the misconception because they were asleep in their spirit. Now think about that and chew on that. When we come to church, should we not be prayed up and ready to go and ready to receive to where when God gives us a word that we can go back and pray over that word that was given to us and judge that, rightfully judge that word in our life? So that brings us to this question. How many pray before we get here that God will give you revelation and will work in your life to what you need? And then we turn around and then how many of us pray over the Word of God after we leave church? Because I'm going to tell you, the devil is looking to twist and turn the Word of God in your mind. That's how we get people, uh, you know, they will take one scripture and they'll pull it totally out of context and there'll be a whole doctrines in their mind over it. Whole belief systems out of one scripture, out of context. And the devil just loves doing the children of God like that. Because see, then when somebody gets in there, like when me get, get in here and I'm talking, and then me and Brother David gets in there and we get to talking, and if the enemy has contorted and twisted and pulled things out of context in our minds, and we have come to, to take that as a true belief, because what did we learn Sunday? Just because we know something doesn't mean that it's right. There's a lot of people that know a lot of stuff out there that ain't right. So if we can get the enemy can take something and get it twisted in our minds, pulled out of context... Then guess what? He can get us into error. And now when me and Brother David, we get to talking, what happens? Now we're in division. And the enemy loves that. Man, he tears churches up all day long with that trick. I mean, that's one of his number one prized possessions that he can come in and do. One thing that God has started teaching me to do is to teach and preach everything in full context. Not pulling not one word out of context, but take it into context and then pull it back into the spiritual realm of what God is trying to tell us. Doing the word studies. And once we get a word study and we start going, then pull that back into context of where it was coming from. Because other than that, we can be very easily misled and taken off down a rabbit trail that we should not be on. And that is what's happening to people all over the place. And you know, there is a difference. There is a Logos word and there is a Rhema word. A Logos word is the written word of God right here. This is Logos or Logos, depending on how that you want to pronounce it. Logos or, or Logos word, that is a written word that was, that was well thought out, well planned, and well positioned into a form. And then there is a Rhema word. A rhema word of God is a suddenly inspired word of God. Now, there is times that when we're reading the word of God, we get a rhema word of God. We read a scripture, and God will give us a rhema word and will speak to us over that scripture. And it meant to speak to us and to edify us, to build us up, to give us encouragement. Even if it's not in the context of what is written there, that rhema word meant to give something to you. It meant to inspire you. It meant to speak to you in a special way, in a special light. But then there's people that turns and pulls that out and tries to make it doctrine. It was never doctrine. It was meant to be encouragement out of a rhema-inspired word. Now, do you understand that? Is that getting too deep? So, but so, so there is a difference than when God speaks to you in a scripture and you get a revelation of it and then you get a revelation of it and that is your rhema word to inspire you to give you the, be, or to give you the strength to fight battle against the enemy that is attacking you. Amen. But, moving on. So, if we let ourselves open up to that point, to where we let things come out of context in our life. Because I could be up here preaching tonight, and I'm here, sitting here, and I'm teaching you what God has poured into my spirit, and I could be teaching you this, and if you allow the enemy, I promise you, he is working now and not if now, before you go to bed, and when you lay down at night, see, your, your spirit, man, does not sleep. 
Your subconsciousness does not turn off. It is on. It's running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that old enemy is going to be pounding on your brain while you're asleep sitting there thinking about butterflies and unicorns in your, in your dreams. And he's got access into your mind just pounding things into it and twisting the word that you're hearing tonight. And then when you wake up, everything that you heard tonight will be twisted or distorted or pulled out of context and then you will reject it and move on and there's no growth. And I'm going to tell you, we are living in a dangerous, uncertain time to be allowing that to happen in our lives. Mm, I mean, I just felt that in my spirit. Did you hear that, church? Because I didn't hear a whole lot of you gasping. We are living in a dangerous and uncertain time to be letting the enemy rob and steal the word of God in our life. If we say the word of God is the most precious thing to us, then how come that we are not treating it like the most precious treasure that we could possess? See, every word that I am preaching and I'm teaching you tonight, you should go home and you should pray over it in the spirit. For one, you need to discern it out for yourself. And you pull it back in to make sure that the enemy, because even if I give it to you in context, this is the way that God meant it, then you have to go back and study it out to have that revelation for yourself that is there. That is your responsibility to study that out and bring that back into context and apply that word to your life and then pray over it and guard it. See, but here we go. 1 Peter 5 and 8, it says, and this is not a new scripture, but I'm going to preach it just like it's brand new to us. Amen? Be sober, comma. Let's stop and think about that a second. Be sober. The word sober there means to be clear-minded. Do not give anything to your, to, to your mind to let it slip or slumber. God convicted me. You know, I had bad back. Got several discs that is herniated and, and was deteriorated. Had several discs in my neck. My hands going numb. Uh, I can't hardly get around. And so I was taking pain pills. And I'd take pain pills. I wasn't taking a whole lot of them. I'd break them in half and I'd maybe take 30 pills. It took me a year to go through 30 pills. So, I mean, I was not by far abusing them. But one day God convicted me when I was doing spiritual warfare teaching and I, I was studying that and God said every time that you let your mind slip you are giving a gateway for the enemy to work and you're not allowing my grace to work in your life. So not only am I not allowing God's grace to work in my life but I'm opening up a, de- a door for the devil to come in and work on my mind. Now I'm not preaching and teaching against you to throw all your pain pills out the door. But what I am telling you is that every time that you do that, the enemy gains a little bit more access into your life. And you are closing out the door for God's grace to work in your life. Because I am convinced that God has, has healed my back and my neck. I mean, man, I get around and I do things. And now I, at my age, I mean, if I go out there and I try to work like I'm 20, you know, I'm sore. But I, anybody that's like that, but I hold my own pretty well. Ask Brother Travis. <laughs> but see, the, the, the thing is, is see, be sober. Keep our minds alert. You know, you know how important it is to make sure that we get rest? Because if we don't, the enemy can come into our minds when we're tired, and that's just like a drug. I'm going to tell you, you know, and I'm not just picking on Brother Dave because I know that I know where he's at. I know. I've been there. I've worked that shift. It's hard. But I'm going to tell you, you start getting tired, you start hallucinating, you get tired enough. Just like you're, just like you're drunk. It's a proven fact that if you're driving while you're asleep, while you're sleepy, that you are, it's just like being drunk. I mean, your brain is not functioning right. So what's giving away? You have opened yourself up. And see, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, you think about that. Think about the mental war that was going on in him because he had not had sleep in nearly two days. 
He was up one night praying all night, and then the next night he was being tortured, and the next day he was hanging on the cross. The mental anguish that was going through him, and for him to keep his thoughts and his mind clear, that when they even tried to offer him some myrrh to ease the pain and stuff like that, he refused it because he was not going to let anything draw him away from being focused in what he was doing. So, be sober, be vigilant. So not only are we supposed to be clear-minded, but we need to pay attention to what? Because your adversary, the devil. Now see, we got to stop again and pause. Your adversary, the devil, diabolos, slander, accuser, or false accusing. And we break that word down. Dia, meaning through. Bala, meaning to throw against repeatedly. And here's where that I like, and where I finally, when I was doing this word study and it come to this realization, bala not only means to throw something repeatedly or to bounce against it, and that is how the enemy works in our minds and how he steals the word of God out of our lives. As he comes and he repeatedly gets into our mind, through our minds, pounding, beating, and taking little bit by little bit by little bit of what God has tried to put inside of you and rob it before it ever gets into your spirit. That's why it's important to pray over the word of God. But here's another thing. Bala was also a word that was used in the Greek to describe a fisherman that was casting a net. Oh, now remember, the word devil is not a name. It's a description of what they used. By law, was used to describe a fisherman casting a fishing net. Now what is a fishing net? A fishing net is no different than what a fishing net is today. The same way, made the same way as what it was then, they are made back then. Same way, they've not changed in thousands of years other than now that they have a little bit better material that they use for weights. But see, it is a round circular thing that is casted out there that has equal amount of weights all the way around the edges of it. That when it's thrown out there, it will slowly sink to the bottom. And that's how a fisherman catches fish. They throw that net out there and that net will slowly sink to the bottom, and as it sinks to the bottom, it starts to encumber and starts to collapse, and when they pull it up, the weights close at the bottom, and the fish is trapped, and they pull it in. Satan does us the same way. Satan casts that net in our mind, looking for things that it can catch. And once that he catch, catches it out there, now what is also the traits of a net? A net is not seen. Because if a net was seen by the prey, the fish, they would swim out from underneath it before it ever had them caught. So a net is invisible. So the enemy comes into our minds in an invisible way, casts a net in there, and as his weights of this world close around us, it finally grabs and traps the Word of God, and it's easily being able to pull out of ourselves, leaving us stray. I say this because, see, I have been accused of this also. And I've also been guilty of this. Because when I ask, what was last Wednesday about, we struggle until I tell you. So was the Word of God in you? Did you study it? Did you have it? Or did the enemy find a way to steal that and pull it away from you? That's the reality of this. And so we have to work diligently to protect our minds from the enemy that's working against us. Or we'll be falling into these seducing spirits drawing us away. But see, the enemy is not running around roaring violently soon who he can chew up his people. No. He's going around silently, boisterously, throwing them nets, drawing people right out. Because I guarantee you, if a lion jumps in this room and roars, we're all going to be making new doors out of this place. Amen. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. But if somebody come in here and threw a net out there and grabbed, he could slowly pull each and every one of us out of this place. Think about that. And that's what God was speaking to me. We think that the enemy is out here just looking to chew us up. No, he's out here to silently 
cast a net and draw us away. That's exactly what he's trying to do in our lives. And I'm wrapping this up right here. Here is the, the last scripture that I'm going to end on. Romans 12 and 2. Again, it's not an unfamiliar passage, but we're going to preach it just like it's brand new. Be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. That word transformed right there is meta, ama, rama, fuo. Goes right back to the word where it says mortif mortified or mortification or mortifus to be transformed, to be changed. So we should want to be changed in our mind to the way that we're thinking into the image of God. And see, that word renew right there is ananana kaya anusus. And that right there is to have a renovation. That word renew right there means to be renovated. It means to be completely changed for the better. Now, I don't know about your renovation skills, but if I'm going to renovate something, if I'm going to go in and do a remodel job, I want it to be better than what I had when I started. Now, there's some that may be a challenge. <laughs> if you're not very handy. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the end purpose of that, of the remodel, is to tear out all the old, all the stuff that is outdated, all the stuff that doesn't work, all the stuff that is bad, and renew it to something that is better. So we need to start changing our minds, getting rid of all the old stuff out there, doing a renovation in our minds, cleaning out all the old junk that doesn't work in our lives, building up something that is brand new in our life through Christ Jesus, judging what is acceptable and what is the perfect will of God in our lives. And stay out of the trap or the net that Satan is working so diligently to trap you in. Satan is looking for a way to twist the word. And unless that we take over and we say, no, I'm going to capture this and I'm going to renew my mind, you ain't getting me, devil. He's going to keep doing the same things over and over and over again in our lives. It takes us making a personal decision that God, I'm not going to allow this to happen in my life.